My father died almost a year ago. I saw his body in an open casket. Yet, now, I hear his voice echoing through a chamber deep underground. I could kill you now, but what fun would that be? When I still have such wonders to show you. I've seen a few of those wonders, and I don't want to see any more. I chided myself for missing all the signs of the dangerous path he'd embarked on years ago. New stories about government investigations into experiments conducted by his company, reports of missing construction workers, and how he seemed to get places far apart at extraordinary speeds. As part of his conditions for not killing us right away by cutting off the air supply, he has demanded that I periodically stop to write up what I've been through. I won't review your notes until this is over, my father's voice had said from the speaker, but I have access to your iPad and will regularly upload what you write so the others can verify that you are being thorough. I want to have a record of how you and your friends react to my facility and the defenses within it. You may as well get a look at what I spent you and your brother's inheritances on, my little bird. Let me back up. In the spirit of being thorough, I'll start with this morning. I woke up with a throbbing headache and carefully avoided the many obstacles our celebration has left strewn over the floor and furniture. Red cups, empty beer cans, and the sleeping forms of my friends and my little brother, Mason. I'm normally a bit straight-laced, but... I'd partied hard the night before, and even discreetly slipped away with two six-packs of beer from the 7-Eleven where I worked to contribute to the festivities. Mason had returned from his first year of college the day before. It was a feat none of us had accomplished, and we all rooted for him to obtain a degree and make it out of our dreary town. I took a look at my peacefully slumbering brother before shaking him awake. He had an inquisitive spirit and the same slim builds and wavy ash-brown hair as his father. The five-year gap between us was significant, in that it meant that I retained extensive memories of my late mother, who I more resembled, while many of his relatively few recollections of her relented to the aftermath of the accident that killed her. Her absence, coupled with our eccentric father's behavior and lack of interest in child-rearing, meant that I had to do most of the work raising him. Of course, Mason was no child anymore. The drinking games we played last night confirmed he was much more experienced in many areas than I was at his age. But our father's recent death cemented that I still had a major role in looking after him. I suppose stealing beer for him while his two years shy of the legal drinking age may not have been a shining moment in the parental element of our relationship, but I shrugged it off. I still had a role to play as his cool older sister. With great effort, I rallied him and my four friends together for the day trip we had planned. Joe helped me load our gear into his rundown SUV, which had been in its last leg since his parents bought it used in the late 90s, and we headed off with him at the wheel. Where are we going, exactly? yawned Mason, a few hours later upon waking from his nap. We're doing some urban exploration. I told him. The rest of us were going anyway, and you said you wanted to tag along. I did? He asked. Joe laughed. Do you remember anything about our plan today, or why we're doing it? Please say yes, I thought, hoping to avoid Joe re-delivering his self-righteous screed. No, said Mason. I sighed. Let me start from the beginning. I've been into urban exploration for a long time. The last few years, I've been making unauthorized visits to a particular set of locations and Nicole and Aisha, motioning to two women my age, resting in each other's arms in the back seat. Nicole had served in the Army Reserves, and she'd been with Aisha for over two years. Aisha had a mousy demeanor, and had met Nicole at a midnight screening at the local movie theater, where Aisha had worked before the pandemic had shut it down. Nicole used to work in construction around the northwest of the state, said Joe. She got wind of all sorts of private projects that piqued her interest. Lots of money being spent by rich people, many from tech companies out in Silicon Valley, to build massive structures in the middle of nowhere. The three of us got curious when site after site remained abandoned even after construction was complete. So? He continued. 
We did a bit of sneaking around after hours. At first we didn't understand why such nice buildings were unoccupied. We'd hoped someone was investigating the region. But it became apparent to us pretty quickly what was really going on when we saw how deep they went into the ground. These were doomsday bunkers for the ultra-wealthy. Uh, doomsday bunkers? repeated Mason. Yep, said Cheyenne, who stretched back in the seat across from Mason. She brushed several strands of faded dyed hair from her face as she sat upright. She was between the ages of Mason and the rest of us. I joined Joe, Nicole, and Aisha after they told me about all these shelters for selfish assholes. These guys spent millions that could go towards any number of good causes on ensuring their own safety and the small chance that society collapses. Uh, wait, says Mason. You're saying they spent a fortune on building something that probably won't even be used? Yeah, said Joe. They have the money lying around and just seeing it like another insurance policy. Some of these places are huge. Helicopter pads, elevators, smart TVs, even indoor cinemas. Each one is a waste of tens of millions of dollars, said Cheyenne. These buildings could be used to house the homeless, or provide a place for orphaned children, or people facing eviction to stay. Heck, these could even be shelters for stray dogs. The guys who built them, though, couldn't care less about any of that. You've broken into a dozen of them now, said Joe. I even dragged your sister along for the last one. I tagged along with maybe a third of their expeditions, and that was the only time I'd visited an apocalypse bunker with them. Uh, what do you do there? asked Mason. Cheyenne giggled and motioned like she was chugging a beer. I rolled my eyes. The headache I still had from last night made me never want to drink again. There's some of that, said Joe, but our main goal is to disrupt the place. Uh, disrupt? asked Mason. Uh, cut wires, break computer systems, mess with the air conditioning, that kind of thing. Whatever we can get away with without alerting anyone to come investigate says Joe. We figure, if some societal collapse really does happen, maybe they'll have less of an advantage as a result. That's a nice sentiment, Joe, said Cheyenne with a sly smile. But honestly, after what our town's been through, I think we all just like the feeling of breaking shit that belongs to people who don't deserve it. Your sister, said Joe, wasn't comfortable with what we were doing at first, but with a little encouragement... She left a real mark at the last sight. I nodded as I cringed at Mason's image of me as the responsible one took yet another hit. After a couple shots of the crappy vodka Aisha had brought along, I'd emptied several cans of spray paint all over the once spotless survival facility built by a social media executive. And, continued Joe, our destination today was her idea. Uh, whose bunker are we going to? asked Mason. You were all excited about it last night, kiddo, I said, laughing. After the accident, I got a look at a lot of Dad's finances. I realized quickly where much of the money went. Business had always kept my dad occupied, such that we rarely saw him, and when we did, he tended to be dismissive towards me, always referring to me by my infant nickname, Little Bird, and only showing real interest in Mason. When I got wind of the helicopter crash, I had to have Mason pulled out of class and give him the news personally. The ensuing responsibilities hit me far harder than grief. I'd expected that we'd inherit a fortune, given our father's luxurious lifestyle. Instead, I discovered that he'd squandered his wealth and left us with severe debts. Before long, we had virtually nothing to our names aside from the house which bankruptcy rules allows us to keep. If we sold it, the proceeds would go to his creditors. Digging through his financial documents, I found multiple references to massive investments and payments regarding a property in the same area as the doomsday shelters Nicole had told me about. It seemed that Dad had chosen a survivalist bunker over leaving a fund for his children. Mason had sighed when I explained this to him. He'd been closer to our father than me, but since the accident... He'd steadily grown disenchanted upon recognizing the dire straits in which his behavior had left us. It's just like him, he mumbled, prioritizing wacky conspiracy theories over his family. 
I expected that my goal was to see how much of the bunker could be liquidated and sold, and that while my friends were tagging around out of interest, I'd prohibited them from vandalizing or interfering with what we found without my permission. We finally pulled up at a small farmhouse at the address listed on the documents I'd examined. It was isolated and surrounded by a barn, empty fields, woods, and a distant river. We got out of the car and stretched our legs in the cool fall air. Joe placed the car keys on the passenger side wheel. He proceeded to light himself a cigarette and offered me one, but Mason's presence encouraged me to turn him down. This doesn't look like a bunker, said Mason. We've seen it before, said Nicole. These executives imagine mobs prowling for resources. They like to keep their bunkers hidden underneath decoy locations. We even found one under a fake parking garage, said Aisha. Well, found is pushing it. Nicole knew where it was because she'd helped install it. I'm honestly kind of shocked I haven't died in a mysterious accident at this point, given how many of these bunkers I know about, laughed Nicole, as she attached her sheathed army knife to her belt. Though, not this one. Your dad didn't involve our company or any that I know of. We'll start with the barn said Joe, discarding his cigarette on the asphalt driveway. Uh, take this, I said, tossing Mason a small pack from the trunk. Like the others, it contained a set of supplies that Joe, Aisha, Nicole, and Cheyenne had accumulated for urban exploration over the years. An LED flashlight, glow sticks, a walkie-talkie, and a small amount of emergency food and water. Nicole kept a first aid kit in hers, and Joe's also contained a hammer gloves, and some duct tape for breaking glass. I checked for the iPad in my pack, which I kept secret in a thick and waterproof case. For obvious reasons, my friends typically didn't make any record of what they did or the vandalism they committed, but I'd already explained to them that I needed to take notes of what I saw. The barn was as nondescript as the farmhouse had bordered, but Nicole quickly identified something abnormal about it. I grew up in a place like this, she said. And the fencing around the pigsty is all wrong. No one could see a pig escape from it. But a predator could easily get in. We searched around it until we noticed a clump of dirt that didn't quite match its surroundings. Joe, Mason, and I proceeded to brush the dirt away until we identified a few inches underneath it, a circular metal door displaying across its surface. Abernathy Industries. Apparently, my dad's ego couldn't resist attaching his brands to the entrance of an apocalypse bunker. Found it, said Joe. Uh, but how do we open it? asked Aisha. I noted a screen attached to the door, covered in a thin layer of plastic that contained an outline of a hand. I removed the plastic and placed my right hand over the screen. It made an angry, high-pitched sound as the words half-match, no entry displayed. What did it mean, half-match? Joe placed his hand on the next, resulting in the same outcome, albeit with the words no match displayed. Let me try, said Mason. When he removed his hand, the screen turned green and read, full match, access granted. The hatch opened. Looks like your dad had a favorite child, teased Cheyenne. I ignored her. One by one, we climbed down a short ladder into a compact structure. The door was slammed shut behind us, but there was another handprint pad on the inside that would allow us to exit. Nicole flipped a light switch, revealing a living room with a couch and television, a small kitchen, a desk boarded by a bookshelf, a bathroom, a generator and a pantry stocked with canned food. Dang, how did your dad waste so much money on this shithole? Asked Cheyenne. Our usual alterations would practically be an improvement. I don't think this is it, I said, similarly underwhelmed. There's more to it, I guarantee you. We explored the small bunker and relaxed for a minute. Aisha opened a container of gin in the pantry and took a shot with Cheyenne, who then complained about the limited channels on the television and how her phone had no service. Anyone bringing you weed? She asked, 
Aisha apologetically explained what was left over from last night would still be at my place. Mason looked at the bookcase while Joe and I knocked on the walls and the floor for any unusual echoes that could indicate hidden areas. There's something odd about the walls here, said Joe. I brushed my hand against the bland beige paint in the area he pointed to, and I also noticed a change in the texture behind it. It's like there's a metal plating behind this area alone, I said. Suddenly, the metal receded, leaving what felt like merely a thin layer of wood, only to then slide back into place. Looking for the cause of the change, I noticed Mason fumbling with books on the shelf. After a bit of trial and error, we realized that pulling back a copy of Atlas Shrugged, Aisha pretended to vomit upon hearing the name, functioned to remove the metal barrier. With it out of the way, Joe tore through the thin layer of wood with his hammer. Nicole and I helped him clear the way into another room behind it. In contrast to the dingy wood and plaster that lined the small bunker we just entered, the room we had uncovered was built with clean steel and concrete. Several electronic panels were attached to its walls. In its center was another hatch downward, its shiny surface well lit by fluorescent light bulbs. So, we were just in a decoy doomsday bunker, said Nicole. Now that's a new one. Whatever lay below, I was sure, was the product of an untold fortune spent by my father. I needed to discover what it was, and my friends weren't about to leave without exploring it. Two buttons were connected to this hatch, and they simply read, Open and Close. I pushed the first to startling effect. Several things happened at once. The hatch slowly opened. As it did so, the panels surrounding us emitted red lights from all directions that moved over each of our bodies. To top all of it off, a recording of a familiar voice played throughout the room. Welcome to safety. Welcome to comfort. Welcome to security. Welcome to Abernathy City. A corny jazz tune played in the background as he spoke. That's Dad's voice, said Mason. I'm sure I looked as perplexed as he did. And Abernathy City? What the hell was this place? I am Mason Abernathy Sr., our dad's voice continued. If you are here, some catastrophe or series of catastrophes has broken down society. You have followed the radio and internet messages I have sent out signaling this is a safe location. You have entered the hatch I have left open for new arrivals, and you are searching for a place where you can help build a better society than the one that failed you. It is important to remember, continued my father, in a soothing voice, that you are wanted here. There is a place for you here. The ID cards you are about to receive will guide you to that place. Please, proceed to one of the floors listed, and you will soon be part of a vibrant and supportive community. The red lights faded along with my dad's voice. The hatch was fully open. Meanwhile, some kind of small printer spat out six ID cards, one for each of us. I examined mine. It displayed a picture of me, followed by my full name, Robin Marie Abernathy, and the words Access B5. In similar prints, it contained my criminal history, which somehow included more than any records I know of would reflect. Not just my single speeding ticket, but also the one time I'd gotten in a fight in middle school and even the beer I'd shoplifted last night, which no one should have already noticed had gone missing. Finally, it listed detailed jargon regarding my physical and mental health. How do they know all this stuff about my health conditions? Asked Cheyenne. I don't give anyone permission to share any of the shit listed here. Her and Joe's card gave access to B1. Masons gave access to B3 through 4, and B6 through 7. Nicole gave access to B2, and Aisha's, like mine, gave access to B5. I slipped my card into my backpack, and followed the others down the hatch. Joe used several glow sticks to illuminate the large room in which we arrived in eerie green light. It resembled a fancy corporate lobby with a floor of luxury vinyl tile. The words, New Arrivals, Please Use the Stairs, were printed above a door in the back. Next to it was an elevator that appeared inoperative. 
I shined my flashlight on a chart next to it, which listed the floors as follows. L. Sorting. B1. Materials. B2. Refinery. B3. Plaza. B4. Manor. B5. Med. Rep. B6. Lab. B7. Hub. Hydro. This place is huge, said Joe. I've never seen more than four underground floors before. And I've got a feeling the floor beneath us is going to be much larger than those we've seen in the past. What is that? said Aisha. She had her flashlight aimed at something on the ceiling. The green light revealed it as shaded, a peculiar, translucent black and white. It appeared like an image from an old film reel and that its pulsating circular form seems to only half exist in the tangible reality we occupied. It was shaped vaguely like a spider, but with multiple insectoid heads divided by appendages that encircled its body. It was about the size of Aisha, who was the smallest of us. The fuck? said Cheyenne. The creature appeared to be resting. It made a low grumbling sound, after which an aperture formed in the middle of its body. Gunky substance dropped out of it onto the floor at Aisha's feet. Aisha shrieked and leapt back. I crouched to get a closer look at the pile of goo. Much of it had the same translucent quality as the creature itself, but several white fragments within it were opaque. I brought my flashlight close and nearly dropped it when I realized what they were. Fractured pieces of human jaw. What the hell went on here? said Joe. We need to leave. We turned to flee, only to stop when we heard scurrying sounds and saw white beams traveling through the hallway behind us like searchlights. This place was supposed to be unoccupied. What did we stumble into? Whatever's here is searching for us, I whispered, realizing they likely heard Aisha's scream. I don't know about all of you, but I don't want it to find us. Looking for cover, I spotted a door marked custodial supplies. Maybe we could hide in here, but what if it was locked? I turned the handle. To my relief, the door eased open. This way, I whispered. Then I realized that an immense pressure pushed the door from the other side. I tried to hold it back, but it was too much. All at once, dozens and dozens of human bones crashed out the custodial door. Collarbones, ribs, and skulls cascaded across the lobby. Mixed within them were glasses, tattered remains of clothing, and the same slimy substance the creature had expelled. The disturbing sight rendering most of us too dumbfounded and shocked to think. Luckily, Nicole remained level-headed. Come on, let's try the stairs, fast, she said, snapping me out of my daze. The lights closed in on us as we ran. Joe held open the door as we shuffled into the staircase. The door shook moments after it shut. Joe held his broad body against it, holding our pursuers at bay as the rest of us descended. We arrived at a door marked B1. Hide in there, said Joe. I'll hold this door as long as I can. Cheyenne held her card up to a small scanner. The door unlocked, and we followed her inside. I rolled several glow sticks into the dark room. What appeared to be a security station lay before us. To the left was an open guard station, and to the right was a pathway through some kind of scanning device that led to the entrance of a large room marked Materials. A sign directed new arrivals to obey staff instructions. Cheyenne, eager to escape whatever was pursuing us, ran ahead. Hold up, uh, let's be careful, called Nicole. To no avail. Cheyenne continued to hurry away from the staircase. The moment Cheyenne entered the scanning area... Glass doors descended rapidly from the ceiling and shut on every side of her. Oh shit, she said as she futilely tried to escape them. We all tried to help her, but the glass appeared reinforced and resisted every attempt we made to smash into it. Another recording of my father's voice began to play, backed by the same innocuous jazz music. This is Mason Abernathy Sr., bearing unfortunate news for you. In other circumstances, I would greet you warmly and welcome you as our contributor to an important function of our self-sufficient society. However, my test runs repeatedly found the unskilled manual labor pool to squander resources and produce, shall I say, unfortunate inefficiencies. 
These problems became more glaring when I identified a cheaper, less demanding form of labor. I'm afraid there is simply no role for one of your limited skill sets in the society that is to come. But I encourage you to spend your last moments soothing yourself with the knowledge that our new society will be stronger, freer, and healthier with you removed from it. There is no greater sacrifice than one made in the name of progress. Last moments? Oh God! Screamed Cheyenne. We're going to find a way to get you out of here, I said, only to quickly wish I hadn't. I had no idea how to help her. The red lights from the scanner changed form. They looked sharper now, more like lasers than scanners. The lasers turned off as each scanner repositioned. Then they simultaneously flashed on again in such a way that all four shot beams of red energy directly into the location of her heart. Cheyenne only had time to make a brief whimper before she collapsed. I instinctively grabbed onto Mason like he was still an easily traumatized child. Nicole and Aisha held onto each other, the latter covering her eyes. The floor to the scanning area opened, revealing a step passage below, which Cheyenne's body slipped away into the darkness. The doors to the chamber opened and the room returns to normal. It bore no indication that Cheyenne had even been in here. We're getting out of here right now, said my brother, pulling away from me and running towards the guard station to the elevator shaft. I followed him. The elevator didn't work before, I said. And even if it brings you back to the lobby, whatever was searching for us could still be there. He pressed a button, and this time the elevator responded. I know, he said, but it's probably still trying to break through the door to the staircase. Right now is our best chance to get out. The elevator door opened, revealing a sight that shocked me profoundly. It was my father, but also something else. It had a half dozen long arms that resembled the appendages of the creature we saw in the lobby, but a human form with one face, a face I had seen my whole life. The unnatural, slimy limbs wrapped around Mason and pulled him inside before he could react. See you later, little bird, said this thing that resembled my dad as a twisted smile spread across his face. The door shut just as I reached it, and all the remains of Mason was his backpack on the floor. I felt a painful thud followed by the cold floor against my face. I awoke some time later to find Aisha sitting over me. She's awake, she called. We were in the corner of the B-1 room, and a surmise that had fainted, but only lost consciousness for a few minutes. Nicole came over to greet me. We were so worried. I think it was just too much for you. My dad's voice cut her off. Now that my daughter is awake, I'd like to have a few words with you all. I sat up, alarmed. Luckily, my dad, or whatever I'd seen on the elevator, was not in the room with us. We were merely hearing his voice over the intercom again, though this time, not as a recording. It pleases me, Robin, that you have brought Mason to me. I know you want him back. He is your only way out, after all. Dad, or whoever this was, was right. If the hatch to the decoy bunker was the only entrance, we needed Mason's handprints to escape. Nobody has escaped from here before. Not the construction workers, not the test subjects, not even my business associates. But you are always capable of occasional competence. Half of you is me, after all. I could kill you now, but what fun would that be, when I still have such wonders to show you? I'll give you a fighting chance. Things in Abernathy City have not gone entirely to plan. Perhaps my method of securing ideal laborers could have used further refinement before implementation. I have produced a facility conductive to the self-sufficient society I want. One without any interference by those who do not understand the power of unrestricted human ingenuity. Please, explore it. You'll probably die, but if you make it down here fast enough, you and your friends may even be able to escape with your brother. No promises, though. He cackled, as if he had said something amusing. He proceeded to instruct us to keep regular track of where we entered on my iPad as a condition for not using his control of the air system to kill us instantly, along with a caveat that he would delete any information that confirmed our location and would alter mentions of last names. 
I'll cause the iPad to buzz when I want a new entry. Don't worry. I won't do that at any unfair time. That's all, Robin. Good luck. We sat in silence for a few moments, digesting what had just taken place. The apparent death of our friend, the disappearance of Joe. He hasn't caught up to us, and Nicole found the staircase abandoned upon revisiting it. The otherworldly creatures, and whatever was impersonating my father. I'd seen his body in an open casket. How could he be talking to us now? I don't want to know the answers to all these questions, even as I have a sinking feeling that I'm going to discover them regardless. I just want to rescue my brother and leave. My iPad buzzed, so I've typed this out so that my father, or whatever is talking to us, can do what he wants with us. Nicole, Aisha, and I are headed out now to search for Mason and Joe, and I could only hope we all make it out of this hellhole alive. We looked over the floor chart outside the elevator on B1 as we planned our next move. This place obviously took years for my dad to construct. How long had he kept this a secret from all of us? The funny thing about my dad is that he kept so much hidden while never letting us have secrets of our own. I'd kept a diary for a few years as a kid, but stopped after Dad let slip several comments that revealed that he'd been discreetly reading it. Now, it turns out that the business trips that had kept him absent for so much of me and Mason's childhood were, in fact, clandestine expeditions to build his fantasy world. It was in character that he had illicitly obtained a vast trove of private medical information in his ideal world, he alone will get to have all the secrets. The elevator stopped here before it became inoperative, said Nicole, pointing to the spot for B7. Great, I said. The only way out is to find Mason, and the only way to find Mason is to go all the way down. We needed to figure out what happened to Joe, too. Hopefully, we can ride the elevator back out again once we get them. Once we get them? repeated Aisha. I wish I had your confidence. There are a lot of things in here that I don't think want us to get out. I'm still processing what happened to Cheyenne. I understand, I said. But if we don't hurry, the same thing is guaranteed to happen to us. We have to keep going and not give up. I recommended that we take the stairs down to the bottom, but Nicole reminded me that none of us had access to B7, at least from the doors that connect to the staircase. Your card only grants you access to B2, and both of you only have access to B5, said Nicole. If we're going to make it down, we'll have to find another way. I wasn't enticed by the idea of entering either floor we had access to directly from the staircase after what happened to Cheyenne. Aisha showed me a small floor map she'd found of B1 and B2 while I was out. She motioned to a shape marked as Supply Shaft on B1 in the room with materials written over the entrance. If it's large enough, she said, we can use this slide to get down to B2 without getting through the front door. We maneuvered through the security station, avoiding the sensor area that had killed Cheyenne. We took our backpacks of supplies with us, as well as the one Mason had left behind. As we approached the materials room, I heard the creak of a door behind us. In the light of a glow stick we'd left behind, a handle slowly turned. We're being followed, I whispered. We rushed into the room. The first thing we saw was a stream of running water. The map says this is the highest of a series of interconnected aquifers that run parallel to the facility. I think they eventually connect to the river we saw outside, said Aisha. Part of the water ran by an enclosed area marked Livestock. As we scurried past it, we noticed that the animals within it were grotesquely deformed. A chicken had two heads. A greenish material coated three pigs in one form with a bizarre oval-shaped center that exuded a murky goo that formed a puddle within which their legs seemed stuck. Their squeals were contorted and uneven. We need to pass through here, directed Aisha, leading us into an arboretum brightly lit by LED grow lights. The area had a sour quality to it, and the plants looked unnaturally tangled. The substance left by the creatures extended across different plants, seemingly joining them together. Watch out! Nicole yelled, grabbing her girlfriend and pulling her back just as a plant swung what looked like a particularly thorny vine. It barely missed Aisha. What was that? 
asked Aisha. We're taking a detour out of here. I tried to follow them, only to gag and fall backwards. I felt myself dragging across the slimy floor, through dirt, and over a series of peppers and cannabis leaves. I tried to call for my friends, but an appendage covered my mouth. I desperately bit into it and found myself surrounded by vile, discolored plants that towered over me. The appendage emanated a liquid substance that ran into my throat. I gagged again as I accidentally swallowed some of it. The leaves, branches, and appendages of the plants around me began to take misshapen, anthropomorphic forms. One that resembled a white lily flower mumbled incoherently. An aloe vera twisted its jagged leaves as it repeated in an androgynous voice, Sorry, sorry, sorry. An enormous Venus flytrap opened its mouth as it waddled towards me. Each side of its sticky leaves vaguely resembled a human face, but the proportions were all wrong. Drink the blood. Ease the suffering, said one through its gaping mouth. Come, tend the garden with us, said the other. The liquid started to have an effect on me. I felt light and relaxed. Vines continued to wrap around me as the fly trap slowly approached, but I did not feel threatened and stopped resisting. In the calmness that followed, my mind drifted. When I was younger... Nicole and I had often broken into empty buildings on our walks back from school, and each wave of layoffs that hit the town created more places to explore. I found myself giggling with a ten-year-old Nicole outside an empty home we'd declared our headquarters. Over several weeks, we carried in patchy furniture we'd found by trash cans on the neighborhood streets and created our own imaginary land to rule over within the vacant walls. In the evening, I laid on the floor with her, and as we gazed at the stars through a hole in the ceiling. There's so much out there I'll never see, said Nicole. All I want is to get out of this dying town and explore some of it. What, and leave me behind? I responded, finding offensive. Your family should have left here ages ago, said Nicole. Your dad can look after whatever business interest he has in the region from somewhere else. You need to beg him to take Mason and you and leave. But I'd miss you, I said. I'd miss you too, said Nicole. But I'd rather us miss each other if it meant that you could go live your life somewhere better. I'm stuck here, but at least then I could imagine myself in your place. A hazy figure interrupted my fantasy as she jabbed a long knife into one of the lobes of the flying trap, which hovered less than a foot from my face. It emitted a loud, high-pitched squeal as a thick, dark red substance leaked out of it. Vine-like appendages retracted as it retreated. Nicole picked up her knife from where it had fallen and used it to hack away my remaining binds. Aisha gripped me from behind and pulled me back out to the pathway. The appendage dropped out of my mouth. My sense of pain and my muscle control slowly returned. I'm so sorry, I'm still here. I said to Nicole. What the hell are you talking about? Said Nicole. She's not thinking straight, said Aisha. I was supposed to leave. They dragged me against a wall as my mind regained its sense of reality. Those plants, they were like, combined with people. I stuttered. They certainly bled like people, said Nicole. She helped me up and confirmed that I was thinking straight again. We didn't have time to reflect further on what happened and continued searching for the supply shaft. We passed a cramped area marked quarters that consisted of tiny slabs of stone before arriving at a foot of a long cave before arriving at the foot of a long cave that resembled a mine. This area was covered with the creatures that resembled the organism we found on the lobby ceiling as well as swampy puddles of the secretion it left behind. There it is, said Aisha, pointing to a metal slide down which rocks brought to it by the creatures fell to be too. It was large enough for us to use. We moved cautiously, cognizant of the danger posed by the creatures, even as those ones even as these ones thus far seemed to ignore us in the favor of their tasks. I looked over my shoulder to confirm that our pursuers hadn't found us. One of the creatures rolled several pieces of dark ore towards the slide. It stumbled weakly before diving into a deposit of the sludge. 
When it emerged from it, it regained a translucent quality that made it virtually impossible to see, though from the glimpses I caught, it seemed stronger and more agile. I quickly lost track of it as it hopped back into the deep end of the mine. I see you're admiring my new laborers, rang out my dad's voice across the intercom. I built in this location many miles from the sides of my friend's shelters, both because of the neighboring water supply and also because I discovered that the ground here contained trace elements of extraterrestrial origin ripe for study and experimentation. Extraterrestrial? A few hours ago I would have laughed at such a comment, but then again, a few hours ago I didn't even expect to even hear my dad's voice again. These creatures, who I call the Chindra, crashed here several geographic periods ago, my dad continued. They remained stuck in a form of stasis until I broke into their ship. The Chindra have a connection to their queen that I don't fully understand, but I do know that the queen merely needs to think up a command for them, and they follow it. So I had my scientists discreetly perform a bit of an operation on me. An operation that involved a substance inherits the creature's biological structures that, among other properties, can, under the right conditions, combine different living beings into one. It took several tries to get the procedure right, but clones like me are discardable. Clones? I thought. No wonder the government had kept trying to investigate my dad's companies. Finally, it worked. And one clone was able to survive the operation and combine with the body of the queen we found on the ship. You are listening to that clone right now. I immediately thought of the implications. This man was a clone of my father, and my real father had died. Right? Or what if the man I saw in the casket was also a clone, and my real father was still alive somewhere? I now have permanent, total control over my laborers, said my dad's voice. Technology and automation play critical roles in running Abernathy City, but the society I want to preside over is one to which living beings contribute, and the Shindra are ideal for the role I have found for them. They can complete many physical tasks at my command, from building concealed exhaust pipes to collecting raw materials to developing metal supports for extending and reinforcing the structure of the facility. I was able to easily create a supply of food for them, and they work hard without sickness, breaks, or complaints. You have no idea how much Abernathy City has gained by replacing its unskilled human laborers with them. Of course, there are some downsides. A tiny number, around 1%, of the Shindra lack a mental connection to the Queen. They act independently and, in the process, have wreaked havoc on several parts of the facility. I believe you saw one in the lobby. It ate much of our staff on that level. But no matter. I have developed a team of hunters to combat them, and the discarded employees are replaceable. Oh, and by the way, I have also assigned the hunters to pursue you as a training exercise. On that note, the only one of you who seems equipped to handle yourself in a fight, Nicole, I believe, may want to duck. Nicole sprang to the floor just as a blast sprayed into the wall behind her. My father laughed as the speaker cut off. Aisha and I followed Nicole's example. The two of us landed in a pool of the substance left by the Chindra. I scooped it up and spread it over my body. I think they won't be able to see us so long as this covers us, I whispered to a confused Aisha. You need to move quickly. Luckily, Aisha appeared to have listened to my advice and fled while camouflaged as the shells only hit the gooey substance and the surface underneath. I held my breath as the figures mumbled something to each other. Oh no, I thought, as they attached pairs of advanced-looking goggles to their faces. One of them scanned the room until he found me and raised his weapon. Joe emerged from behind the man and shoved him to the ground. Run, he yelled, as the two struggled. I watched as Nicole and then the barely visible, frail form of Aisha sprang down the slide. I leapt from the same destination as more shots, presumably from the other two hunters, echoed throughout the cavernous room before it awkwardly tumbled to the next level. The room below was loud and also filled with the Shindra. Above me, several operated a furnace while others guided molten metal into massive ladles. I looked down at myself. I was largely visible again. The fall down the slide had scraped off most of the substance and left me with several bruises. 
I needed to move, something Nicole and Aisha appeared to have done already. But what would I do next? I had no way to get to B3 from here. The only thing I could think of was to reach a staircase, use my pass to get to B5, and hope there was a way to enter that didn't cause me to meet the same fate as Cheyenne. I jumped over an assembly line on which a combination of automated machinery and alien creatures assembled food, clothing, and other products. I found myself by a tarp that blocked off an area with a horrendous odor. I peeked inside and nearly vomited at what I saw. Piles of dozens and dozens of human bodies, as well as sets of bones stripped of their flesh. A tiny opening in the dirt wall on the other side led to rapidly flowing water, a small stream of which funneled into a trough from which the Shindra sipped. The creatures climbed over the bodies. Their mouths rotated, taking turns grabbing and chewing bites of human meat. Several of the bodies belonging to powerful-looking men in suits. Many more wore construction helmets and vests. I dropped to my knees when I recognized Cheyenne's limp form among them. Aisha crept up to me. Get up. We have to keep moving, she whispered. As with me, the fall had stripped away most of the ooze, rendering her almost fully visible again. I nodded, glad one of my friends had found me. I saw. In there. I know she's in there, she said. But like you said, we have to keep going and not give up. She reached over her hands to help me to my feet. I smiled, only for her blood to spray over my face as a shell crashed into her upper arm. I ran to help her, but she begged me through her tears and gritted teeth to run. I did, and watched from behind a stack of crates as one of the men subdued and searched her. He found her ID card, and after examining it, bandaged her wound, picked her up, and carried her out of sight. Sweat had soaked through my clothes as my heart beat furiously. I was in great danger, as well as shocked at what I'd just witnessed. At least my dad's men had stopped the bleeding. I would have to find and free Aisha later. I crept low to the ground around the indifferent alien creatures while trying to suppress the image of them chomping away at the remains of Cheyenne. I searched the room for an exit, but instead found Nicole wrestling with one of the men who had followed us down right by the foot of the slide we'd taken. He threw Nicole against a stack of cartons, but she kicked his feet, causing him to lose balance and drop his shotgun. Nicole pulled it away before she <clears throat> Nicole pulled it away, but before she could use it, the man whipped the sidearm out of its holster and aimed it at her. Now, said the masked man, tell me where your friends are, and I'll make this quick. I instantly recognized his voice. He, too, was a clone of my dad. How many clones did he make? Were they the only ones running this place? Before he could respond, and before I could intervene, Joe yelled down at him. One of them's up here! He kicked the massive ladle of molten metal such that its contents rained down on the hunter, who screamed as his body and the floor underneath him disintegrated. What remained of his lifeless form dropped to the surface below. I ran up to Nicole and hugged her. Joe hopped down and joined us. Thank God you two are alright, said Nicole. And Joe, it looks like you've made us a passage to the next level. The distance to the surface below was substantial, but I felt certain that we could find a way to make it down safely. The security man had left behind a pair of the goggles I'd seen earlier. I scooped them up and put them in my backpack. I then gave Nicole the bad news. I have to tell you, Nicole. One of them took Aisha away. She's hurt, too. Nicole's face reddened. She picked up the hunter's shotgun and angrily pumped it as I heard a distant sound on the far end of the room. I identified its source. It derived from the third hunter, who watched us from an elevated area near the top covered room of corpses. He removed his mask and looked directly at me. He, too, was unmistakably a clone of my father. He held a grenade in his hand, and I realized that I'd heard him remove the pin. He smiled menacingly as he drew his arm back to throw the grenade at the three of us. Nicole! I blurted out. The last one! He's in the corner by the tarp! Nicole's military instincts kicked in. She spotted him, lifted her shotgun, and rapidly fired twice. Blood spurted from his shoulder as he dropped the grenade, which rolled behind the tarp. 
He frantically dived after it. It took me only a moment to realize why he tried to retrieve it rather than run to safety. A deep, rumbling sound followed that of the explosion. Oh, God, I said. What is it? asked Joe. The water. I didn't need to complete my sentence, as Nicole and Joe got the point immediately. A massive cascade of water swept the tarp away and overtook the room, toppling everything in its path and expanding the size of the hole created by the molten metal. The bodies, many half-eaten, were swept away, along with all the creatures in the area. I held onto a metal beam until it, too, detached from the surface. I took a deep breath as the waves of liquid plunged me through the opening into the level below. I remember falling, rolling off a soft flap and sinking into several meters of water, where the torso of one of the dead hunters impeded my attempts to swim to the surface. When I finally pushed it aside and reached the air above, I gasped and made my way to the nearest non-submerged surface, which I recognized as the top of an arcade claw machine. Luckily, in terms of avoiding electrical shock, it was powered off, like the rest of the devices in my immediate surroundings. I catch my breath. I grow cognizant of the pain caused by my many bruises. I recoil at the disgusting liquid in which I was just submerged. I pray no predators or security personnel have me in their sights, as I am unarmed and defenseless. My iPad buzzed in my backpack. Apparently, this is enough of a moment of peace for my father to demand another write-up, and it seems that the waterproof case protected it well enough to make that possible. I look around, hoping that my friends were as lucky as I was, and have also survived the fall. But I have yet to spot any of them, or the remaining hunter Joe had tackled on B1. It takes me a moment to grasp what B3 Plaza consists of. The last thing I expected. A massive shopping mall. One now filled with debris and a murky river of floating bodies. I last visited a mall during an urban exploration outing about three years ago with Joe and Nicole. It was just before Nicole had met Aisha, and about a year before Cheyenne joined us. It was the last mall in the region and I had fond memories of it from its last grasp as a cultural center in the early 2000s. It took my mother 30 minutes to drive me and my then two-year-old brother to it. I remember following her through the massive, snow-covered parking lot into the vast space inside. People from all walks of life happily bustled between well-stocked stores. A Christmas tree stretched up to the wide ceiling of the laminated glass, I delighted at the holiday decorations as my mother plopped me into Santa's lap. Those were good times. But you've probably already guessed the derelict state it was in many years later when Joe, Nicole, and I snuck in after dark. The factories that left for cheaper labor overseas took the local economy with them. Only a handful of third-rate stores remained, and they were on their last legs. Ceiling tiles were missing, rubble and shattered glass lay strewn over large areas of the floor. We were there during the summer, but I'd seen pictures of snowfall throughout the broken overhead windows, and covered with the artificial Santa set had once thrilled me. My present surroundings went far beyond what I witnessed in 2002, and instead represented what I had only seen in movies taking place in the 80s or 90s or at least they likely did, before the floor above spilled a putrid river of decomposing bodies, supplies, and hardened molten metal over its lower level. This floor was twice as tall as the others, allowing space for an upper and lower level connected by an escalator. The ceiling was painted light blue, a poor substitute for the sky I yearned to see, and held bright lights. Some flickered irregularly, while many others, no doubt affected by the massive hole the molten metal had made in the ceiling, dangled limply and failed to function. I noticed a thin and translucent ladder-like structure extending down from the hole. Dozens of the Shindra who had fallen to B3 ran up it back to B2. 
The mall stores sold toys, men's clothes, women's clothes, lingerie, electronic gear, food, tools, and plenty else. The bottom level had a merry-go-round, I, I think I rolled off the tarp that covered it earlier, a food court and a video arcade in which I found myself positioned atop a claw machine. I'd never won anything from one, but Mason had once snagged a giant plush frog that he'd kept in his room through middle school. Hey, you! called a chubby man. He and a curly-haired woman swam towards me through the muck. Both were dressed in gray uniforms. We're coming over to you. Well, at least not everyone here is a clone of my father. I had every reason to expect them to be hostile and prepared myself to dive back into the water and swim out of the arcade. Hopefully, Nicole and Joe had survived and would be close by. The woman climbed out of the water and balanced herself on the glass, casing of a coin pusher machine a few yards behind me. I rolled my eyes when I saw the face proudly etched into the pieces of silver within it. The man, not finding a surface that could reliably support him, grabbed onto the top of a mini bowling machine. Their supply belts indicated they were maintenance people. I haven't seen you before. Are you from B5? The woman asked. I nodded. I had access to there, so it was likely an answer that wouldn't give away that I was an intruder who had helped cause this mess. I didn't think they let y'all out, said the man. The rumors I've been hearing are that y'all get pumped full of, well, you know what, and they keep you on a real tight leash during the pregnancy until you deliver. Then the process starts anew. I didn't think y'all even had access to the plaza. What the fuck? I thought. Oh, God. I recalled the extensive notes on my card about my physical health and how Aisha and I were both assigned to be five. Was MedRep a place for fertile women to deliver children? The repairman's description didn't exactly make it sound like a mere facility to assist women in pregnancy. I had the feeling that Dad's calculations alone determined whether and when someone got pumped full of you-know-what. The hunter who carried away Aisha did so after checking her ID. He must have taken her there after seeing that she was assigned to it. All the more reason to get to her as soon as possible. Do you know what this disaster is all about? Asked the woman. I shook my head, wanting to give up as little information as possible. We were here to address an issue with the overhead lighting, said the man. But this is absolute hell. Never seen anything like it. Good thing the mall was closed and powered off when whatever this is happened. Otherwise we'd be shocked to death. I need to get back to B5, I said. All this flooding has disoriented me. Do you know the closest way down? Well, most of the hatches and the door to the main staircase won't even open when there's flooding, said the man. And the elevator's powered down at the moment. There is a door by the restrooms upstairs, said the woman. It leads to a maintenance hatch down to B4. It's on a different system and would probably still work. My father's voice rang out over the intercom before I could respond. You're probably surprised to find yourself in this setting, Robin. Let me give you a quick explanation. This country saw in the 80s and 90s the beauty of a free market left relatively untouched by those arrogant enough to think they should interfere with it. The shopping centers brought together people from across our society. They spawned innovation through competition. They made us wealthy and happy. So, I decided to incorporate consumer culture in Abernathy City. The denizens of B1 and B2, back when I was still planning on using human workers, would work for a few dimes a day. In their bi-weekly hour of free time, they would be permitted to spend what they earned down here on the very products they put together. The academics on B4, the medical staff on B5, and the technicians on B6, who earn much more, are still to be the primary customers. Robin, I'm so close to achieving my dream. All I need is a few more modifications for this whole facility to run like clockwork. And when it does, the plaza will be at the center of its society. Returning to our present predicaments... I've got good and bad news for you. First, the good news. 
Based on the response I found online, your summary has thus far not been lacking in detail. As I've said before, I haven't read what you've written yet, but I look forward to reviewing it when this is over. Also, you'll be delighted to hear that Mason is alive and well. And your other friend, Elsa, was it? Well, I am delighted to inform you that she's about to become contributing to one of the most important tasks of all in a self-sustaining society. What is this? asked the man. Who's the boss talking about? I feigned confusion, even as I fretted over Mason and Aisha. Now for the bad news, continued my father. You and your friends have been a serious annoyance to me. The damage you've caused will take quite some time to repair. I've put the Shindra to work on patching up the leak you created, and they stopped the flow of water for now. But the flow may remain in my shopping center for quite some time. You may have noticed that the ooze produced by the Shindra has a binding quality to it that assimilates different life forms into one living entity. Well, let's just say that I did a bit of experimenting with it to produce something that could defend this facility in a situation like this from intruders like you. This did not sound good. I closed my backpack and tied it tightly to myself. I needed to flee and I wanted to take my supplies with me. I'm taking off the kid's gloves, Robin. It's time for you to face your hardest test yet. I really didn't expect us to have another of these conversations. You'd never held up well against strong adversity. It's been fun, little bird. The hell was that about? Said the repair woman. As the sound cut off, I noticed a thin red dot on the wall behind me. I followed it as it approached me and then disappeared from the wall. What's that on you? asked the woman. I glanced down and noticed that the light now hovered on my chest. I'd seen enough movies to know what was about to happen. I dived into the filthy water and swam away as I heard two gunshots ring out. When I surfaced at the other end of the room, the man was gone and the woman drifted lifelessly in the water. I pushed her body away from me and noticed two bullet wounds in her. The shots meant for me must have hit her instead. You can add poor Miss Hershing to the list of people who have suffered because of you, said my father. Not from the intercom, but from the very room I was in. Was he another clone sent to kill me? Poor Robin, always wanting to do good, always ending up doing harm. You got that from your mother. You certainly didn't get that from me. I scanned the dimly lit room for him. Did I see something moving near the claw machine where I'd just been stationed? The water shifted unnaturally there and something solid glided atop it. A submachine gun with a laser sight. A translucent face gradually turned in my direction. It was my father, but his skin resembled that of the Shindra, in that it heavily blended with the background. Surprised to see me like this. He said with a smile. He raised his gun. I dived again and swam desperately for the arcade entrance as I heard the loud thuds of gunshots. Blood dispersed into the water before me as a shot meant for me hit the corpse of a man I recognized as the owner of another doomsday shelter. The one I'd spray painted months earlier and an old business partner of my dad's. I surfaced by the merry-go-round where I gripped a horse's head for support as I treaded water. The escalator upstairs, not functioning, of course, was on the other end of the shopping concourse. I had to get up there and take the maintenance shaft down. But it was a long way to the escalator, and the route was littered with wreckage and floating corpses. Hopefully, I could lock it behind me to at least delay this clone and the third hunter from before, if he was still alive. A thump sounded on the roof of the merry-go-round directly above me. Little bird, called my dad. He must have climbed up there and seemed to be using a flashlight to scan the area ahead of me. I know where you're going, and I'm not going to let you make it upstairs. You could really use a pair of wings now, couldn't you? He laughed. Boss, is that you? Cried the voice of the repairman. Dad's flashlight shifted to where he'd waited by the entrance to the toy store. He must have fled after seeing his partner shot. 
Have you seen my daughter? The clone asked. The destruction would be my only chance. I knew that if I swam for it, I'd never make it to the other side without being spotted. So instead, I lay on my back, kicked off from the merry-go-round, and floated, doing my best to quietly fit in with the numerous bodies that filled the corridor and only gently kicked to keep myself moving in the right direction. It was hardly a perfect illusion, but hopefully I would avoid detection in the darkness long enough to at least put some distance between me and my dad. I think so. A young woman was with me in the arcade. I... I heard the repairman say. His voice was close. I must have drifted towards him. Why can't I see you, boss? Where did she go? Asked my father's clone. I brushed against another body as I glided further away, measuring the distance by the passing lights on the ceiling. No idea, he said. Where are you exactly, boss? All I see is the flashlight. I drifted underneath several functioning lights that cast me in greater visibility. I tried not to shiver in the freezing water. Thankfully, my father didn't seem to notice. Then you were no use to me, said my father. I felt myself bump into the maintenance man. Huh? He said, startled. Uh, uh, wait, boss, I think I found... Two more shots rang out. The heavy force of the man's body crashed into me, sending me underwater. There was no use in pretending any longer. I swam while submerged, pressing onwards despite the weight of my soaked backpack, as far as I could go. When I surfaced for air, only a few shops remained between me and the escalator. A ring of light appeared around me only a moment later. I dived again as my dad fired. Luckily, a nearby half-eaten corpse shielded me from several shots as I swam closer to my destination. I didn't have time to process why I recognized the corpse's faded, dyed hair. Bullets hit the water all around me again when I next surfaced. Most landed in the space between me and the stairs. He was trying to block my path. One bullet ricocheted off the wall. The next thing I remember was incredible, reverberating pain as high-pitched noise flooded my head. I grabbed my left ear and, to my horror, discovered that part of it was missing. Panic and shock ran through me. I hurried into the nearest store, which sold men's clothing. I dizzily sputtered in and out of the water. The world spun around me even as I grabbed onto the dry top of a clothing rack and tried to calm myself. Clever girl, blending in with the dead like that, called my father. But not clever enough. I'm coming for you. We're about to have a little awaited reunion. He was getting closer. I heard distant gunfire from upstairs. Perhaps Nicole and Joe were facing a similar enemy. I needed a place to hide. Uh, maybe I could lure him deep into the store and sneak out the way I came in while he searched for me. I found myself against a wall. Uh, how did I even get here? Uh, what part of the store was I in? Uh, I was bleeding. Uh, a lot. And likely to get infected from exposing an open wound to the toxic substance in which I was immersed. I'm here, darling. Come to Papa said my dad. The noise my wounded ear had sent into my head had diminished enough for me to understand him. I used the wall to push myself along until I found a corridor away from the soaked clothes that filled the store. I realized I had stumbled into a series of dressing rooms. I swam to the last one and locked the door. You've got a lot working against you, Robin. Not only am I stronger and smarter than you, but I also know how you think. You're hiding in here, hoping to draw me in and then sneak out the way you entered. That was my plan until my dizziness led me to the corner myself. It was only a matter of time before he found me. From the sound of his voice, he was in the area by the check-in counter. I had a few moments as he looked through the store. I've read your diaries, your emails, your text messages, he continued. It delighted me to no end when I learned that you would make a trip out here. If you texted the date and time, I would have prepared a welcoming committee. Why did I spy on you like that, you may be thinking. I wanted to see if you'd measured up to the family name. And guess what? My early assumption was correct. You didn't. I threw my drenched backpack onto a small, raised surface replacing clothing as I stood on a cushioned sitting platform that extended from the changing room's wall. I took out two objects. 
Your grades were painfully mediocre. You didn't excel at anything. Sports, hobbies, you name it. You even lacked your mother's ability to find a superior marital partner. Her only skill. He was on the opposite side of the store now. If I wanted to escape, now was my chance. But I knew I wouldn't make it. I know everything about you, said my father. He was at the entrance to the changing area. Luckily, I had a plan, and that plan involved him coming to me. I know you had your first kiss with that no-good Sheldon boy after seeing your prom. You waited over four years after that to get laid, only to lose it to a lousy one-night stand with a guy you just met and never talks to again. The most awkward two minutes of my life, you texted Nicole the next morning, he said in a mocking voice. Haven't held a guy for more than three weeks since. If he was trying to rile me up, he was succeeding. I'd known about the diary entries, but it pained me to realize that this monster had reviewed virtually every private correspondence I'd ever made. It's no wonder you've ended up at a convenience store, spending your free time with a bunch of dropouts and vandals, said my father. He knew he'd found me. I heard him push open the door to the first of the three changing rooms. You always were a disappointment. The second door opened. I put on the goggles I'd taken from the hunter earlier as I braced myself. I blame your mother for creating you, taunted my dad. He was in the stall next to me, moving more slowly as he cherished the moments of impending victory before he caught up with his prey. But after she gave me the male heir I wanted, she became useless to me. She wasn't worth the trouble it took keeping around, much less the trouble of divorcing her. Little bird, you still think, even after all that you've seen today, that she died in a random accident, don't you? You inherited that naivety from her, not from me. I've never been more furious as rage coursed through my veins. Even so, I composed myself and lifted my arms. Our journey is at an end, Robin, said the clone. I hope you've enjoyed the tour so far. He was directly in front of me. Only the flimsy wooden door divided us. I fired three times through the barrier. He made muffled screams. I heard him crash into the water. You didn't count on one thing, Dad, I said, kicking the door open. My goggles saw through the camouflaged skin of my fleeting father. One of the shots had hit his gun, which drifted broken in the water, and the others had hit him. As he feebly tried to wade away, he brushed against the wall and left behind a trail of blood on its white paint as he did so. You're far sicker than I've ever realized, I said as I followed him. But I knew that you spied on me when I was younger. I knew you were lying when you said that you wouldn't review my notes until this is over. More specifically, I'm sure the clone I've been talking to has been reading them and sharing their contents with you. That's why I didn't mention that I picked up a gun from that fallen hunter in the last update. That's why I wrote that I was unarmed and defenseless, which I really wasn't. I fired a fourth shot into the back of his head. He collapsed into the water and stopped moving. I returned the pistol to where I'd kept it in my backpack. I'd known that my dad would outgun me in a fair fight. My dad was a gun enthusiast, whereas my only experience with firearms was when the coal helped me fire a few rounds at a makeshift shooting range the five of us had made out of several weeks worth of empty beer cans in my backyard. But I had a plan in case I got cornered, and miraculously, it had worked. As I reached the escalator, I heard the sounds of a firefight upstairs. I climbed the steps carefully, staying low and using the metal sides as cover. I saw Nicole crouched by the front corner of a jewelry store. Her stained, sleeveless white t-shirt exposed the strong arms with which she held the shotgun she'd nabbed earlier. In the back of the store, behind the cash register, was the remaining hunter, yet another clone of my dad. Unlike the one I just fought, he was fully visible and didn't seem to be joined to any degree with the Shindra. Did they all retain my real dad's memories and consciousness? How was that even possible? He noticed me and let off several shotgun blasts. 
I ducked and covered my head as the metal around me shook violently. I heard two more shots after that, followed by Nicole's voice. You can come out now, Robin. I'm so glad you're alive. I emerged cautiously to find Nicole standing over the hunter's whimpering body. Joe and I have been in a long standoff with him. He didn't know I was there. Your distraction was all I needed to get the drop on him. Shot him twice in the chest. She snatched away the dying hunter's shotgun, removed its shells, loaded some into her weapon, and slipped the rest into her backpack. You look like you've seen better days, said Joe, as he stood up from behind a sunglass stand. But I'm glad that you're okay. That guy had me pinned down there for ages. You need to get that treated, said Nicole, motioning to my ear. She whipped out her first aid kit, removed an antibiotic ointment, and prepared a set of bandages. Go ahead, whined the hunter. A pool of blood exited out from him, and he clearly had no capacity to move. Get it over with and kill me. Let me have your knife, I said to Nicole. She looked at me blankly. Now, I asserted. She handed it to me. Hold him down if he tries anything. I ordered my friends. I proceeded to drive the blade into the hunter's chest between his gaping wounds. The hunter screamed in further agony. What are you doing? cried Joe. How about we make this as long and painful as possible? I said. Unless you answer my questions. Uh, Robin, we're not like that. Nicole said. Do you have any of my dad's memories? Yes. Croaked the clone. Up until he last had his brain scanned on B-6, about a year before the helicopter accident. After that, I have the memories of the primary clone, who you've been hearing on the intercom, and then my own memories once I was created from him. Did you really kill my mother? The clone smirked. I've made some mistakes in my life. One of them was waiting six years after Mason's birth to get rid of her. I should have done it sooner. He spit blood up at me. Anger coursed through me. I dug the knife deeper into him and twisted it. One more question, I said, as his blood and saliva ran down my cheek and dripped back down onto him. What does that clone, the primary clone, want with Mason? The clone nodded through the pain of two gaping shell wounds and a knife protruding from him. Your real father, the one who died in the crash, has been kept in the same stasis chamber used by the Shindra since the helicopter accident. He isn't dead, just extremely close to it. The one you saw at the funeral was a clone created just to be used there as a prop. What does that have to do with Mason? I asked. The clone ecked out a gleeful smile. Your real dad wants to resume the life he had before the accident. We've developed a technology to help him. One that can transfer a consciousness between bodies. Not just create a new clone, but actually cause him to experience his own life continuing in a new body. It's built around the mechanism through which the Shindra Queen communicates with the rest of the Chindra. The bodies have to be compatible and compatible bodies are hard to find. The clone continued. They require certain physical, cognitive, and genetic commonalities. And differences in sex and gender can pose substantial obstacles in humans. So, for the time being, as we continue the testing phase, we render the facility only accessible to those fully compatible with him. We were soon going to begin soliciting ideal individuals using our access to medical records. If we got desperate, we would even accept someone half-compatible like you. Though, your father would be reluctant to try a risky procedure just to inhabit the body of an unperforming female. But luckily, you and your friends brought an excellent candidate right to us. Your father wants to take the form of the son who better resembles him and bears his name. The procedure will upgrade Mason's current consciousness. The boy will simply be replaced by an improved version of himself, his father. Have I answered all of your questions? Can I die already? Fuck all of this, said Nicole. 
Mason, gargled the clone as he raised his head closer to me. We'll grow up to be just like me. It is inevitable. I kicked the knife deep into him with all the force I could muster. The clone finally stopped breathing. Joe kept saying something to try to calm me down. I I didn't. I couldn't listen. I walked clumsily in a circle before collapsing on the ground. When I awoke, Nicole had wrapped a towel around my wet form and bandages around my ear. Joe had gathered our arrangements. The shotgun, my firearm with four bullets left in it, a fire axe, and Nicole's knife. Joe, who still had Mason's backpack, realized it contained Mason's keycard, which will give us access to the bottom level when we needed it. I shared with them the information I'd obtained about the service entrance to B-4, and then the painful news I'd heard about where Aisha had been taken. Nicole was as furious as I expected. A sense of urgency drives each of us. To get Aisha, to get Mason, and to get out. My iPad, barely operating and with a crack in its screen, buzzed and I quickly typed this update, just in case my dad, should I say, the primary clone, still has the ability to cut off the air supply if I fail to do so. Don't worry, there are no lies or omissions this time around. I hope, Dad, that you can forgive that minor deviation from my otherwise thorough notes. Nicole, Joe, and I are heading down for Mason and Aisha. We will stop at nothing and I recommend warning anyone else still present in Abernathy City to stay the hell out of our way. The service hatch opened to be four, Manor. We arrived to find a tiny corridor containing electrical wires and a series of unmarked doors. Which one do you think leads to B5? Joe asked. I shrugged. Nicole picked one randomly, and we gathered around it with our weapons raised. Joe turned the handle and shoved it open. Five uniformed men turned to face us with dumbfounded expressions, all had holstered weapons. We'd stumbled upon a security station. Wait, I said. But it was too late. The men reached for their guns. In the cacophony that followed, Nicole shot three of them dead. I got off one round with my pistol before Joe charged in my line of fire. He swung his axe deep into one of the man's heads, pulled it out, and then used it to finish off the guard I'd wounded. Holy hell! Looking over the carnage we'd created, blood covered the walls and the screens of security monitors. Don't act so shocked, Robin, said Nicole. We saw what you did to the hunter upstairs. Now hand me your weapon. She proceeded to fully load it, using ammo she scavenged from the fallen guards and handed it back to me. Joe dropped an axe in favor of one of their firearms. I looked over the feed on the monitors, which appeared to cover most of B-4, though not the service corridor through which we had entered the room. The floor consisted primarily of large, well-furnished wooden walls lined by paintings, several of which portrayed my father posing like royalty. Multiple rooms housed densely shelved collections of books. Men and women read from Men and women read from them, wrote, and appeared engaged in debate. The bedrooms for the residents here would have fit in luxury hotels. Hello, Robin, said the voice of my father's primary clone over the intercom. You would do well to treat a city named after your own family with a bit more respect. I rolled my eyes. No one in the video feed reacted, indicating that his voice projected only into the security station rather than the entire floor. Fuck off, Dad. I said, I know what you did to our mother. You and every one of the other stupid clones of you are absolute fucking monsters. Do you feel that way about your brother, too? My dad responded. He's so similar to me, after all. He will be me soon, too. Mason isn't like you. I said, he'll never be like you. You sound awfully sure of yourself, sweetie. We'll just have to see about that, assuming you even make it to him. I'm feeling confident about our chances, I said, looking over the blood-soaked room. Your little security station wasn't much of an obstacle, said Nicole. My security personnel have had an unfortunately high mortality rate recently, conceded my dad's clone. 
Though I do appreciate you exposing the hole in their monitoring system regarding the service access corridor. I'll have a camera added there before sending in a replacement team. Who are these guys living and working here anyway? Asked Joe. A combination of willing and the unwilling, said my father. I offered stock options to those who would agree to undergo a long-term test of this facility. Others volunteered out of interest alone. Others, well, were volunteered by me. I need to make sure this place is running as smoothly as possible when catastrophe falls. The only way to achieve that is through testing. What's the point of this floor? I asked. It looks like a bunch of people reading and writing. Uh, let me guess. They're looking into eugenics. Or witchcraft. The manor houses the future intellectual elite, said my dad's voice. It is a place for conducting research and cherishing the finest works of literature. But my test run is not gone as smoothly as I'd hoped. I started with a broad group of thinkers, all people who supported the concept of a self-sustaining city, but with different ideas about how to achieve it. I thought there'd be strength in this measured diversity of thought, but I was wrong. You'd be amazed just how quickly people's ideologies can change. They begin to demand that I implement better conditions for the laborers, back when the laborers were humans. They even encouraged the workers to organize. I can't have that down here, now can I? So, continued my dad, one by one, I had the so-called intellectuals sent down to B5 for doctor's appointments. When I came back, their minds were a bit more in line with the superior set of ideals. They began to make progress again. If only I had invented the procedure years earlier, I could have similarly altered your mother's psyche. She could have been of use, and I wouldn't have needed to discard of her. I asked Joel for his axe and proceeded to strike the intercom speaker with it. Now, now, Robin, don't lose your temp- The speaker sputtered and fell to the floor. The voice of my father's primary clone cut out. I've had enough of this shit, I said. A knock sounded on the door. Not the one we'd entered, but one that seemed like a main entrance. I checked the monitor. A chubby, formally dressed woman in a jacket and dress pants waited at the door. She looked unimposing, but we still had our guns drawn when we opened it. Who are you? What are you doing here? She stuttered. You tell us first, said Nicole. The woman gave her name as Georgia and explained that she was waiting for security escort to take her down to B-5, citing that B-4 had lost communications with it. How about you lead us there, said Joe, and we don't kill you in return. She nodded anxiously. Joe walked directly behind her, keeping his gun wedged into her back as we went. Nicole and I selected the jackets the guards had been wearing that had fewest holes and bloodstains and partially covered our weapons with them as Georgia navigated through B-4. The denizens of the floor largely ignored us, rarely giving us more than a glance as they continued with their studies. There was something about their total focus on their work and the forceful way they carried themselves that resonated with me as familiar. Finally, we stuffed into a small room that contained a hatch that led down to B-5. Will you let me go now, like you said? Pleaded Georgia. She shook nervously, and I felt momentary sympathy for her. Could she be someone volunteered by my father to live here? I'll go down and make sure it works, said Joe. If it does, we'll leave you tied up here. You'll need my keycard to access B-5, said Georgia. Can I reach for it without one of you shooting me? Don't bother, I said. Tossing my card to Joe. I continued to watch our prisoner as Joe descended. This lady seemed harmless, but I kept my gun on her all the same. Nicole threw off her jacket now that we were out of sight of the others and got down on her knees to view Joe's progress. Is it really necessary to point that thing at me? Asked Georgia. I've been a prisoner here for so long. All I want to do is leave. I can tell that's what you want, too. After what we've been through today, we're not taking chances, I said. Don't worry, don't worry, this will all be over soon. I can tell you've been through hell, said Georgia. If I were in your place, I'm sure I'd act the same way. She took a seat against the wall. It works, called Joe, but something's terribly wrong here. What is it? asked Nicole, peeking her head into the shaft to get a better look. 
Oh, God, cried Joe. The Shindra, they've... He screamed horribly. Joe! I called to no response. We have to get down to him. Nicole nodded and got to her feet, only to immediately shriek in pain. My concern for Joe had caused me to let my guard down. Georgia had used this moment to pull two syringes of yellow liquid out of her jacket and jam them into Nicole's exposed shoulder blades. Nicole stumbled and collapsed against the wall. Georgia dropped the syringes and drew a long knife. I leapt to the side, narrowly avoiding her as she charged at me with it. She grabbed at my gun, and my attempts to pull it back from her resulted in it falling out of my hands and down the open shaft to B-5. The situation had changed dramatically. Only a moment ago, my two friends had provided me some level of protection. Now I was unarmed and fighting for survival, and I could only hope Joe and Nicole were still alive. How many people is it now who have died or who are about to die because of you? Said Georgia, holding the knife in front of her. Your dad was right about you. Your problem is that you're always several steps behind those who are more intelligent. I figured Joe would meet with trouble down there. Three of the independent Shindras are on the loose, wrecking havoc on B-5 as we speak. There'd be a team of hunters down there to stop them, but you and your friends took that option off the table. It'll take weeks before we can clone a new team. I realized where I'd already seen the mannerisms of the intellectuals on B-4. Of course, my dad wasn't going to allow intellectuals to work independently, uh, to him, the only acceptable outcome is for everyone on this floor to think the same way that he thinks. Yes, you're starting to understand, said Georgia, reading my face. She cackled. I find it so amusing, seeing you work things out when it's already too late. We used our studies of the Shindra hive mind to make a few neurological alterations to me and the others living here, to get them to think similarly follow the path your father laid out for them and build upon his work. My thoughts used to be blurry, and now I see the way forward with immense clarity. What did you do to Nicole? I asked. When I heard the commotion in the security station, I nabbed the closest weapon I could find that I could keep hidden on me, said Georgia. This knife and two sedatives. One is enough to knock a grown man unconscious. And two probably dead without medical treatment. But who knows? Different people react in different ways. Maybe your friend will live through the day. Or maybe she's already dead. I think not, said Nicole. She shoved Georgia forward, causing Georgia to stumble into the shaft. Georgia's head slammed violently into several steps of the ladder as she toppled to the floor. Nicole coughed and vomited. I yanked the syringes out of her. They were empty. Georgia had injected their entire contents into Nicole. Can you make it down the ladder? I asked. It pains me to see the strongest of us so miserable and sickly. She nodded. I don't know how much longer, but I can keep going. But we have to get Aisha. I helped her through the painful process of descending down the ladder. We left her shotgun behind and proceeded with only my pistol, which I retrieved from the floor and stuck into my backpack. Nicole wrapped her arm around my shoulder, and we slowly hobbled to the entrance to B-5. No, sighed Nicole. No, no, no. Joe's corpse lay on the floor in tatters as one of the Shindra ate from it. Its circular form rotated as each of its heads alternated, taking bites from his flesh. Fucking kill it, muttered Nicole. It stopped chewing, took a look at us and ran away before I could fish out my firearm. As it fled, it camouflaged and disappeared into the corridor ahead of us. Help me go after it, said Nicole. No, uh, we have to finish our goal, I said. Which isn't revenge, but getting out of here with Aisha and Mason as quickly as possible. If we do that, there's a chance we can get to a hospital and save you. Nicole reluctantly acquiesced. I picked up Mason's access card from Joe's backpack as we hobbled through a long corridor. The flickering lights illuminated blood splatter and human bones. We arrived at a sign pointing to the left for medical, and to the right for reproduction. So that's what it meant by medrap. We went to the right. Joe and Cheyenne, mumbled Nicole. 
Her balance became increasingly worse as the sedative in her took on greater effect. It became exhausting to help her walk, but I refused to leave her behind. What the fuck went wrong with your father? How could he do this to us? I remember when mom died, I said. I was in the hospital waiting room with dad and Mason several hours north of town, near where she'd been hurt. Uh, near here, in fact. I think Mason was six then. Uh, when the doctor told us there was nothing they could do, Dad gave Mason a few words of sympathy and ran off for a business call. Mason asked me all sorts of questions after life and death, and it took all my strength to stop myself from crying, and it took all my strength to stop myself from crying as I answered them. I was eleven, and I had to take on a parent's responsibilities. After a while, I took Mason by the hand and led him outside to an ice cream store down the street. That cheered him up a bit. When we got back to the hospital, Dad had already gone home. He'd forgotten about the two of us completely. Oh, fucking hell, said Nicole. Yeah, I said. He's always been a complete sociopath. I think he thinks that he loves Mason, but I know that he really doesn't. He only loves this place. And that's because it's built in his own image, said Nicole. You and me had our own fantasy land once, remember? Our own headquarters to preside over. But we let it go and grew up. Grew up is putting it generously, I said. But still, said Nicole. It's an odd thing to say, given the horrors we witnessed, but there's always something so childish about all this. Of course, this place was never going to work. No matter how many equations your dad produced to showing the opposite. I didn't respond. Nicole needed to apply all her energy just to keep walking with my support. We arrived at the door marked reproduction. The room inside was humid and filled with steam emitted by a collapsed pipe. I realized we were standing in a scanning station like the one that had killed Cheyenne, but it had been torn apart such that many of the electronic components were out of place and shined their red beams onto the ceiling or the upper walls. A distorted recording of my dad's voice played on a damaged speaker system. It slowed and deepened his normally smooth voice. The sound cut off irregularly. Well, welcome to a lifespan of purpose and contribution. If you're hearing this... Our scans have found you're healthy and you're weak, fertile, which makes you an ideal candidate for control procreation. Your participation is mandatory, but do not worry. Our medical staff is happily sedated throughout the process, and upon successful childbirth, you will have two hours of freedom on the arboretum. Be one. Is removable at any time of proof of your doctor. Nicole reached her hand into my backpack and withdrew something heavy from it. Se -se Several options. Impregnation if available. Our medical staff will happily discuss each of them with you. When you cease, contribute to the contribution of our people, you will also be able to choose between effective methods of liquidation. Now, relax and... Sparks flew off the wall as Nicole emptied my firearm into several speakers and an audio control system. She succeeded in cutting off the recording. Nicole, that was all the ammo we had. I stammered. She nodded. Vacantly, looking even sicker than before. She was barely conscious. I I'm sorry. I I'm not thinking straight. Please help me find Aisha. We marched onwards, even as flickering lights and the heavy mist obscured our vision. I heard something quietly moving out of our sight, likely Shindra attuned to our presence by the sound of the gunfire. As I guided Nicole over small piles of human bones and tattered clothes... We reached a concrete wall that attached to a mounted fire extinguisher. It also contained a sign with arrows pointing in different directions to Ladder to B6 and Patience. I directed Nicole to lean against it so that I could rest my aching shoulder. She slid to the ground and lay crouched against the wall. As I recovered, a slithering sound rapidly approached us. I tore the fire extinguisher from the wall. All at once, a Chindra, its outer layer a misty gray, leapt out of the fog. I swung the heavy extinguisher with all my might, making direct contact and sending it back into the mist. I heard it retreating, but felt little relief. It would be back. I pulled Nicole up 
and hurriedly led her in the direction of patience. We arrived at a series of glass rooms, most contained a vacant hospital bed and medical equipment. The blood and guts of nurses and patients tore apart by the rogue Shindra dripped from the walls and ceilings of several of the rooms. Finally, we arrived at one that, unlike the others, was sealed shut. A doctor watched us from inside. In the bed behind her was Aisha, who was attached to an IV. She was dressed in a hospital gown and appeared semi-conscious. Don't open the door, said the doctor. We're only alive because those things can't get through the reinforced glass. Who the hell are you? Are you the hunters sent to fight them? She looked skeptically over our miserable selves. I needed to act. I let Nicole down against the wall and removed her knife from her backpack. Ignoring the doctor's pleas, I hit a button that caused the glass door to slide open. What are you doing, you idiot? Said the doctor. You're going to get me and the patient killed. I charged and held the knife against the doctor's throat. Has the operation begun on her? I said. Answer me, or I'll fucking kill you. As she looked at me blankly through half-open eyes, she started to make a half-smile, like she recognized me. Her arm wound was thoroughly bandaged. No, it hasn't, said the doctor, glancing down at my blade. I realized that if I'd made the same threat before arriving at Abernathy City, my target wouldn't have believed that I'd go through with it. But now, this doctor correctly realized that I'd slice into her neck without hesitation if she didn't tell me what I wanted to know. I'd enjoy doing it, too, given what this doctor did here. She was scheduled for artificial insemination later today. You should be grateful. We've treated her arm wound. It's practically as good as new. We're taking her away, I said. Get her up and off whatever you've got running through her. And hurry. I maintained watch as the doctor slowly removed the IV from Aisha and helped her to her feet. I needed to do a better job than I had with Georgia. Aisha staggered forward with the doctor's help. Her composure started to return. She curiously felt her hospital gown and grew anxious as she soaked in her surroundings. Robin, you came for me. She identified Nicole's collapsed form through the glass and stumbled out to her. Nicole remained conscious, but only barely. Aisha cradled Nicole's head and gripped her hand as they whispered to each other. As they reunited, I had the doctor stuff Aisha's clothing and other belongings from a drawer where they'd been left into my backpack. I quickly explained to Aisha what she'd missed, as well as how quickly we needed to move if we wanted to have any chance at saving Nicole's life. You, I said to the doctor, can you, or the doctors in the medical wing, do anything to help Nicole? But it was too late. While I was talking with Aisha, the doctor had snuck into one of the other glass rooms we'd passed that still had an open door. She promptly sealed it shut. I frantically hit at the outer button to open it, but unlike before, the door remained closed. Before entering, I turned off the outside controls, she said. You can override it, if you can guess the 12-digit passcode. I'm staying here until this is over. And to answer your question, I could have helped her. In fact, I may have been her only chance. The rogue Shindra has likely annihilated the rest of the medical staff. I noticed that, contrary to my expectations, Aisha had a vengeful smile. I looked inside the glass chamber and realized why. On the wall behind the doctor, the camouflage of a hidden Shindra started to change colors into its natural shade. Aisha and I held Nicole between us as we exited the hallway of horrors, while the doctor's screams echoed behind us. We followed the sign to the hatch to B6 which I used Mason's card to open. Nicole had passed out by this point, though she was still breathing and maintained a steady pulse. We have to carry her down, I told Aisha. I'll go first and you can lower her to me. When I was halfway down, Aisha frantically called for the knife, which I tossed up to her. When I climbed back up, I found Aisha stabbing maniacally at one of the Shindra. It bled all over the floor as it tried to crawl away. Aisha pulled it back and continued her onslaught until it stopped moving. From the dent on its side, I figured it was the same one I'd injured with the extinguisher. It tried to pull away Nicole, said Aisha, wiping away the creature's blood from her face. We felt incredible relief when the door to B5 sealed shut above us. The Shindra didn't seem to have made it down to B6. My iPad buzzed, 
and I quickly typed up this last summary in a tiny room that connects with the hatch while Aisha changed back into her clothes. I explained to Aisha an idea I'd had. We could find one of my dad's clone's bodies on B3, cut off its hand, and use it to open the hatch to escape. That way, we could at least bring Nicole to a hospital. But Aisha wasn't interested in leaving without Mason after I fought so hard to get to her. Even if I was willing to do that, she said, we'd have to carry Nicole so far and survive so many obstacles. Our best bet is to get to Mason and take the elevator back up. I was relieved at her decision. I want my brother back more than anything. This may be the final occasion that I write up one of these summaries. Have you been bluffing about the air system all along, Daddy's primary clone? You don't seem to actually have much control over this facility. But still, I'll indulge you this one last time. I have no doubts that our next exchange will be in person. I've been here before. It was in this very hospital that my sister did her best to comfort me after our mother's car was found toppled off the hilly precipice. She was a safe driver. How could this have happened? Robin asked my father. He shrugged. In the last few hours I've spent waiting nervously for an update about Robin's condition, I had gone through my sister's iPad. It's fractured and on its last bit of power, but still operational. Robin's entries have taught me so much about what she went through on my behalf and about the lies I'd gotten myself caught up in believing. A strange feeling compels me to type this up. Robin wrote detailed descriptions that still need a conclusion. By writing this, I feel like I'm helping her complete something meaningful. It's not much, but... It's enough to make me feel like I'm assisting her in some way as the fight for her life takes place in another room outside of my control. From what I can tell, these entries are being posted online 24 hours apart, regardless of when they were written. My best guess is that a clone of my father set them to automatically upload in this manner. A doctor with a stern expression approaches. He speaks quietly and firmly. I have good news and bad news. One will be fine. The other did not make it. Let me start where Robin's summaries left off about me. I was pulled into the elevator by a creature resembling my father. At the pointed tip of one of his long, insect-like limbs, which resembled a stinger, jutted sharply into my back. The sleep that followed was deep. I found myself at the back of the park, near the end of a cross-country race, at my high school's course. I saw my dad waiting by the finish line. He'd shown up for once, uh, something he never did for Robin, and rarely did for me. Strength surged through me as I sprinted past runner after runner. I finished in third place, shaving nearly twenty seconds off my best 5k time in the process. I was eager to tell my father, but I couldn't find him. Eventually the crowd dissipated as parents brought their kids home. I waited, alone, until Robin pulled up. She already knew why I was so distraught. He left when he saw that I wasn't going to win, didn't he? I said. I've told you time and time again, said Robin. The more you try to please him, the more he'll disappoint you. You did great, kiddo. Don't forget that. And don't waste your time seeking his approval. When I awoke, I found myself in a bed in a compact living quarter. I got up to find the room decorated with pictures. That one included my father, me, and Robin. A few indicated my father and me, most portrayed only him. The figure from the elevator entered wearing a long black cloak. Welcome, he said. I'm so glad you have awoken. The doctor from B5 had assured me that such a small dosage of the sedative I had pumped into you would wear off quickly, though it might have some effect on your short-term memory. More than anything, I'm just happy that we're together again after so long apart. I had many questions, and he provided me answers. He said things I at first assumed were the delusions of a crazy person, but that I since found evidence to support. He was not my real father, but a modified clone of him. My father had found hive-like alien life called the Shindra, buried beneath the surface, and this clone had undergone an operation to combine himself with their queen. It helps me control the regular Shindra as they perform minor maintenance tasks in dangerous areas, he'd explained. 
The queen's insect-like appendages, which remained a part of their combined body, could insert a sedating chemical into an enemy. He was wearing an outfit to cover the appendages so as to not frighten me. He could control all the Shindra aside from a few rogues who acted independently, such as the ones who'd wrecked havoc on the lobby staff. We were at the bottom level of a facility he'd built as a doomsday shelter. He walked me through an array of computer monitors and controls. These control the nearby hydroelectric power system, which draws facility power from a subterranean water flow, he said, motioning to several dials. And these determine the temperature in each room, he said, directing me to several others. You still haven't addressed why you kidnapped me, I said. You pulled me violently into an elevator and sedated me. That's an odd way to reunite with someone you claim to be happy to see again. He directed me to a video monitor system. Here's the footage of what happened. I watched as my form pressed the elevator button. Behind me, the camouflage ginger from the lobby silently snuck up. The door opened, revealing the man I was speaking with, who pulled me inside just as the creature pounced. When I violently tried to resist, he stunned me. As you can see, I only acted to protect you. I wasn't about to believe that. My dad, or whatever this thing was, had the means to alter footage. But it was still possible that what he showed me was accurate. Uh, what about Robin, and the rest of her friends? I asked. Are they safe? Yes, he said, motioning to another monitor. The feed that played on it showed Robin, Nicole, Joe, Aisha, and Cheyenne climbing out of the fake shelter to the surface of the farmhouse. So Cheyenne didn't die, I said happily. Correct, said my father. She was merely knocked unconscious. But the things the recording said. My dad rejected my claims that his voice had announced her last moments. Nonsense, he said. The sedative is playing tricks on your memory. I remained skeptical, even as he played a recording titled B-1 Entrance. This is Mason Abernathy Sr., bearing unfortunate news for you. In other circumstances, I would greet you warmly and welcome you as a contributor to an important function of our self-sustaining society. However, the facility remains in a testing stage. I'm afraid there is presently no role for one of your particular skill sets at this time. As a trespasser with no role to serve here, you will be stunned and directed back to the surface. Whether we press for criminal charges is contingent on you keeping secret anything you have seen here. I was understandably hesitant to accept this. So, you're telling me that after stunning Cheyenne, that my sister and my friend simply left me behind with you? I asked. You really expect me to believe that? That is what happened said my father. You see, I explained how we were tracking down a rogue creature in the lobby, the Shindra responsible for all the bones you found in the custodial closet. They agreed to come back once we had resolved the security problem and promised to tell nobody about me or the facility in the meantime. I'm sure they'll be here soon, and I'm not holding you here against your will. So, I'm free to go? I asked. Of course, said my father. Whatever you want. But first, I just want to talk. To explain myself. I've spent so much time around people of lesser intellectual capacity, it's refreshing to be around a relative equal, even one who has yet to realize his potential. Will you let me do this, or do you prefer to leave now? I agreed to hear him out. I still had so many questions. He took me next to a cold, sterile room where he removed a cover. Underneath, another body of my father... Uh, this one, with several long flesh wounds, stood upright within a glass container filled with a faint green mist. This is the original, he said. I was constructed using data stored from an experimental scanning procedure he underwent about a year ago. There are other clones in this facility, as well as one outside of it. They all derive from me. So, uh, this is my real dad, who died in the helicopter accident, I asked. He shook his head. He never quite died. This body was brought here straight from the accident, where it has remained in a form of stasis ever since. His brain should be sufficiently intact for his consciousness to be transferred into another body. You're going to make another copy of my father, but 
this one with his mind as it existed at the time of his death. I said, Something like that, said the clone. To him, his life will simply continue where it left off. Now, this way. I followed him to a large holographic display within a massive room that contained dozens of computers and control stations, as well as an entrance to the inoperative elevator. A floating image of Earth appeared on the display. This is a test lab for the algorithms I've developed regarding end-of-the-world scenarios. I've inputted the present global conditions. Invariably, within decades, the entire planet is consumed in some disaster. Environmental catastrophe, a global warming, nuclear war, a disease. As he spoke, the threats he described played out on screen, depicting decreased counts of the world's population. Fires raging over continents, and the edges of land masses disappearing under rising water. We need to be prepared for the fall of humanity in its current form, he continued. The shelters built by my colleagues and the fellow-minded elites are but temporary respites. They may house a family or two, but no more. This shelter, unlike those, is designed to ensure that civilization as a whole may continue, and that the next civilization lacks the flaws that caused the previous one to crumble. You may be skeptical, he said, and I do admit that some people have died as I have ironed out insufficiencies in this facility's design. But did you know that only 12% of the original colonists at Jamestown survived its first five years? Great progress follows great sacrifice. I always thought you were more like me than your mother and sister. You have my ability to not let short-term costs blind you to long-term benefits. He sat down with me and showed me equations, statistics, and maps. As had been my tendency my whole life, my many irrational concerns about the man I was speaking with faded under the weight of my desire to gain the approval of the only father figure I'd ever had. The one whom I, until recently, had given up hope of even ever seeing again. At first, the material overwhelmed me, uh, but my brain began to link together the numbers and terms he threw at me such that I started to know the point he was about to make before he even made it. Periodically, he left the room to make what he called regular updates over the intercom before returning and continuing to guide me through a thick stack of books and pamphlets. He showed me other locations around the planet where he hoped to build facilities similar to this one. A sense of discovery thrilled me. What once seemed complex now seemed simple. The path my father showed me was a path towards efficiency. It would take sacrifice and hard work, but in a hundred years' time, it, it could pay off. But there was also so many variables. Dad's calculations didn't take into account the effects of depriving others of freedom of choice, nor did they take into account how many people really behaved when faced with the coercive tactics he intended to employ. As time elapsed, I thought, fleetingly, to ask my father if he knew how long I had before my sister and her friends returned. But, in truth, I didn't want to go. Not yet, at least. Uh, what he was showing me intrigued me too much. You understand what I'm telling you, said my father proudly. It's remarkable that some minds are so strong that they can flourish, even after spending so much time in environments inconducive to positive development. Your sister did everything she could to lead you astray, yet all it took was a few hours of lights to guide you out of the darkness. I shot him a sharp look. I didn't agree with his digs at my sister. Still, I hadn't been this close with my father before, even if it was just his clone, and chose not to pick a fight about it. We returned to the security monitor feed. I want you to see, son, just how efficient this facility is already. I watched the men and women happily toil on B1 and B2, the diverse group of intellectuals arguing amongst each other on B4, the doctors monitoring the pregnancies of the volunteers on B5, and the scientists performing cutting-edge research on B6. On B3, they all mixed gloriously in the pristine mall. I couldn't believe my eyes. Was this another trick, or did my dad's ideas really pan out as he planned? I... I can see how this could work, I said. He put his hand on my shoulder. I sat down to resume my studies. As I did so, a thought dawned on me with alarm. This facility would be essential to rebuilding a better society. 
the sooner a catastrophic event sent crowds here, from which the best educated doctors and engineers and the most fertile women could be culled, the sooner that process could begin. It wasn't just inevitable that something would investigate a collapse. It was almost desirable. That is, if you accept the premises and the confines of my dad's reasoning. Now, excuse me for a moment, said my father. Please stay focused on your studies until I return. He walked out of sight. I remained more doubtful of what he was saying than I let on. But my father was asking me to accept a lot that it was hard to believe about the events that transpired before I awoke here. Still, he acted loving in a way he hadn't before. I'd yearned for that kind of connection, and he'd unlocked something passionate in my brain that made me feel deeply alive. Nonetheless, my tempered skepticism led me to creep quietly across the room to get a look at what he was doing. He stood before the video monitor system at the far end of the room. I ducked behind several panels until I could see him through a crack between two blinking machines. When he pressed a small button, the video on the monitors changed. Instead of the mundane images of employees performing routine tasks, the feeds displayed rooms covered with blood, collapsed floors, and a river of floating corpses. On one screen, one of the Shindra emerged from heavy camouflage on B5 to devour a doctor locked in a glass room. Her arm detached, followed by her head. Blood spewed into the air and blocked the camera feed. My father pressed a button, and the footage returned to what it was before. Ideal images of harmony and efficiency. I whirled around, returning to my desk, and refocused on my books. I had no doubt my father hadn't wanted me to see what I just witnessed. Were the monitors my father showed me earlier an illusion? Something staged or digitally altered for my own benefit? Was my sister still here and in danger? Or was I the one in danger, and my father just didn't want to worry me? I didn't bring anything up when my father returned, as I didn't want to let on that I disobeyed him and seen something I shouldn't have. Uh, the studies continued. My efforts to hide my suspicions were successful, as far as I could tell. I resolved to confront him about the monitors later, when I'd settled down from the excitement of all that I was learning. Uh, eventually, he got up to make a few adjustments to the control panels. After his departure, I noticed a strange flickering of light ahead of me. Uh, looking closer, I discerned an outline of a living being. It was camouflaged, just like the creature I'd seen tear up the doctor on B-5. I grabbed a sharp letter opener from the desk to provide myself some defense from danger. The figure moved quietly across the control room. It stopped before the elevator control system, where it flipped a switch that caused the words operational and lobby motor active to display on a monitor. The barely visible figure then turned towards me. Was it about to attack? What are you looking at? Asked my dad, having detected my concern. I, I didn't know what to say. It seemed like one of the rogue Shindra, which posed incredible danger. But why would it turn on the elevator switch? I, I'm not sure, I said, pointing at the shape. There's something here. My dad threw off his coat and swung one of his appendages through the air. It rushed past me as it unfolded, and its sharp edge lodged into the form. Red blood dripped out of it where it made an incision. Mason, no, I wanted to tell you, said a familiar voice. Oh God, no, I thought, how could it be her? Another of my father's appendages wiped away the camouflage substance that coated Robin. Robin? Robin? I exclaimed. What are you doing here? Dad told me he let you go. I started to realize just how much of what my dad had told me had been lies. I'd had so many opportunities to figure this all out. I should have acted on my skepticism. But I'd chosen his survivalist obsession over recognizing the danger my sister could be, and indeed was, in. It had been so obvious. All the contrivances, uh, all the conveniences. How could I have been so blind? Was I destined to be just as delusional as him? I'm here for you, Mason, said Robin. She was in incredible pain, and my dad kept her frozen in place. She was sweaty and dirty, and had bandages wrapped around her ear. We need to leave, now. Don't believe a word she tells you, said my father. I begged him to let her go, but he ignored me. Mason, pleaded Robin, 
You need to help me, please. She looked sickly and weak. No, he doesn't, said my dad, again ignoring me. He understands now. Dad, stop that, I yelled. She's your daughter. What are you doing? Mason, on B6, I saw technicians finishing a procedure to replace your consciousness with our real dad's, said Robin between gasps. This clone is going to kill you just like he's going to kill me. Kill you? I said. I turned to my dad. Dad, what are you doing? Mason, said Robin. You have no idea what he's capable of doing. He's poisoning me. Nonsense, said my dad. I'm merely inserting a mild sedative to calm her down. Your sister has always been a bad influence on you. Don't listen to her now. How long have you been lying to me, Dad? I asked. Robin, meanwhile, looked weaker and weaker. Mason, you have no idea what's at stake here, gasped Robin. On B-6, Dad's scientists are manufacturing catastrophes that will cause the end times he wants. Diseases. Computer viruses. She lost the ability to speak as agonizing pain appeared to pass through her. More lies, said my father. But I knew that Robin was telling the truth. What she described was the inevitable conclusion of the reasoning my father represented to me. Dad, I called. Stop now. What did I become? I'd spent my life looking up to my sister. She'd given me unwavering love and guidance, and now I was hesitating to act as she lay dying before me. My father had abandoned me again and again and lied to me from the start. I resolved at that moment to do everything I could do, what Robin would want me to do. I used the letter opener to slash at the appendage that was stuck in my sister. My dad yelled and pulled it back. Robin fell to the ground. I dived as another extended limb shot over me. Using a wide computer system for cover, I crawled quickly to the hydroelectric control panel and moved a dial marked pressure from where it sat at 2 to its maximum setting at 10. What are you doing? called my dad as the facility rumbled. He ran towards me. I calculated correctly. My dad would prioritize attempting to revise what I had done over stopping my escape. This bunker is what he cared about, and not me or Robin. I grabbed Robin, who was alarmingly non-responsive, and pulled her towards the elevator. You'll bring down the whole structure, yelled my dad. He attempted to turn the pressure dial back, but it sparked and broke down in response. The earth shook heavily. I fell to the ground as Aisha appeared. Mason, come on, she said. She helped me up. I later learned that they only found enough of the substance on B-5 to coat Robin, so Aisha had stayed with Nicole by the hatch from B-6 while Robin activated the elevator. We drug Robin between us, and we stumbled to the open elevator door, where Robin had already deposited the unconscious Nicole. The doors closed, and the elevator began rising. Out of the glass wall, I saw the primary clone kneeling before my real dad's body in stasis, as if asking for forgiveness for failing him. Water began to leak through the walls around him, which steadily broke apart. His voice rang out into the elevator, his words barely discernible amidst the thundering noise around him. You're probably wondering why I lied to you, son. I could have simply kept you unconscious until the procedure to transfer your father's consciousness into you was ready. It's because I wanted to show you what I devoted my life to. The ideas that I tried so hard to realize. When you saw simulated images of the facility functioning as intended, it was like I was looking at myself realizing my life's dream. A dream that escaped me. I took shortcuts. I miscalculated human behavior. I made sacrifices that didn't pay off as reality distorted my vision. I suppose I've known, on some level, for a while, that this project was doomed to failure, even as I boasted about its success. I just haven't had the strength to admit it to myself. I won't survive this. So I just wanted you to know, son, that I've all... His voice cut off as B-4 collapsed. The water rose rapidly beneath us as we ascended the flooding floors of the bunker. When we passed B-2, the water from below connected with the aquifers, which the Shindra had only narrowly sealed off, and the floor started to collapse. The elevator creaked and slowed. I held Robin, who had regained consciousness. Robin, we're going to make it, 
I assured her. We reached the lobby level only for the elevator lights to cut off and the door to refuse to budge. We have to open it manually, I said to Aisha. We pulled as hard as we could and managed to wedge the elevator doors a few feet apart. I'll hold it, I said, applying adrenaline-induced strength as Aisha pulled Nicole and Robin outside. Aisha followed them, and I wedged myself through as the doors slammed shut behind me. The floor of the lobby shook violently. Aisha climbed up first. I lifted Robin, who albeit feebly progressed up the ladder by herself, and then Nicole, whom I pushed upwards until Aisha was able to pull her into the fake bunker. The vinyl tile of the lobby floor fractured and collapsed behind us. I sealed the door shut behind me as we scrambled to the service. Outside, it was early morning. Aisha collapsed into the grass, breathing heavily from exhaustion. We have to keep going, I said, helping her up. My feet sensed a growing disturbance in the earth just below us. We unlocked the car using the keys Joe had left on the wheel, loaded Nicole and Robin into it, and sped off with Aisha driving. Behind us, I watched as the farmhouse and the barn collapsed. Was this whole area going to wash away? I held on to Robin as Aisha drove. Hang on, Robin. Please, just hang on. I whispered tearfully. She nudged her head slightly towards me. Brother, she said with a satisfied smile, before falling out of consciousness. Aisha berated me for giving Robin away. I took her venom. She was right. I should have caught on to Dad's lies sooner than I had. I had wanted to believe in him so badly, even though I should have known better than to do so by now. Even now that I know the horrors he inflicted upon others, it saddens me that his project was a miserable failure. His calculations about the dangers of impending doom weren't wrong, but his solution was ill-fated from the start. Had he shown me the hydroelectric control station on purpose, so that I'd get the idea to use it to do something he couldn't bring himself to do? To destroy his life's work? We passed empty stores and empty houses until he arrived at the hospital, where Nicole and Robin were rushed to the emergency room. I've been waiting here with Aisha ever since. Officers came by with questions. They wanted me and Aisha to go to a police station tomorrow. I don't know what we'll tell them, or what we'll tell Joe's and Cheyenne's relatives. For now, only my sister's well-being matters to me. The doctor had explained what she meant when she told us that only one of them will make it, but I chose not to listen. I didn't want harm to befall Nicole, but I also wanted my sister back. I think about all that Robin had done on my behalf. I wonder what will become of me without someone like her guiding me. Will I turn out like... No. No way. I won't ever be like him. Right. Aisha rushes into the hospital room when a cold greets her with open arms. They laugh and smile. I step out. Doctors hand me paperwork. I fill it out. The cause of death is listed as poisoning. Are they going to think that I killed my sister? But then again, would they even be wrong? Aisha finds me and takes me to Nicole. Nicole's emotional state is much more complex now. Her knowledge of what happened to Robin, Joe, and Cheyenne tempers her joy at finding Aisha, me, and herself in good health. Does she blame me for Robin's death like I blame myself? Nicole runs her hand through my hair and smiles. It makes me so happy to see you again, she says. What happened to Robin isn't your fault. You didn't know she was coming for you. You didn't know how depraved your father really was. I didn't mean what I said earlier. You're not going to be alone, says Aisha. We'll be here for you. I grow red from a mix of strong emotions. Excuse me a minute. I I need some air. There's a police officer pacing in the hallway. I slip past him. It's raining outside. I decide to walk over to the ice cream store Robin brought me to the first of the now three times when I mourned the loss of a family member. Only... When I arrive, I find nothing more than a derelict building with a sign marked, closed, out of business. 
I take a seat at the empty table outside its shattered front door and look over the bright graffiti on the wooden boards that cover where its windows once were.